Welcome to today's webinar, Dietary Considerations and Ataxia. Please note that all attendees are in listen-only mode and that this webinar is being recorded. I'm Lori Shogren, Community Program and Services Director for the National Ataxia Foundation, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Questions can be typed in the chat box found in your control panel. We will answer as many questions as time allows prior to the end time of today's session at the end of the presentations. And we will have a record of all questions asked and will respond to any unanswered questions in the days following the webinar. In your control panel, you will also find a few helpful handouts that include Dr. Perlman's book, Nutrition and, pa and the Patient with Progressive Central Nervous System Disease, and NAS fact sheet, Diet for Ataxia which provides diet ideas for discussion purposes only with your physician. The presenters for today's webinar are Dr. Susan Perlman, who has worked in ataxia for over 30 years. She serves on NAF's Medical Research Advisory Board and is the Medical Director for NAF's Board of Directors. Dr. Perlman is a Clinical Professor of Neurology and Director of the Ataxia Center at UCLA. Dr. Perlman authored many publications including the book, Nutrition and the Patient with Progressive Central Nervous System Disease. Our next presenter today is Amanda Gallagher, who is a speech and language pathologist with Johns Hopkins out, out, Outpatient Brain and Stroke Rehabilitation Program and the Johns Hopkins Ataxia Center. And now we'll hear from Dr. Perlman that will start out our webinar today. Welcome, Dr. Perlman. Thank you, and thank you all of our listeners who have signed in, and I'm sure we'll have many very good questions that we'll be getting to at the end of the formal presenta presentation. Sure. Over 25 years ago, next slide, the National Ataxia Foundation, in cooperation with me, my ataxia clinic, and my dietitian Nadia Hamid, put together a book about nutrition in patients with ataxia. We looked at known disorders that were progressive with no cures, but could have dietary management. And you can see in the table of contents, um, after the general introduction to the basic four food groups, macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, we do talk about specific disorders that at that time did have dietary interventions. For instance, tardive dyskinesia is a movement disorder that is caused by use of certain psychiatric drugs. Choline is a nutrient that when increased in the diet can help reduce the symptoms of tardive dyskinesia. Of course, now 25 years later, we have better psychiatric drugs, so the incidence of that disorder is less. Then there are also specific medicines that have been approved that can treat it. But back at 25 years ago, the high choline diet was looked at as an intervention. Similarly, for ALD, adrenoleukodystrophy, a known inborn error of metabolism, that could affect mobility, could contribute to ataxia in people who had that metabolic problem. There, uh, back up, there was, uh, back up, there was one diet that could help get around the metabolic problem and improve symptoms in younger people and potentially older people with that disorder. That diet is still in use today. The ataxia diet, as it were, next slide, had these key features. Elimination of refined flour and sugar products, using complex carbohydrates instead. Elimination of processed meats with their variety of high salt content and other additives. Obtaining fat in one's diet from lean meat, poultry, and low fat dairy products. No skipping meals. So this diet, as recommended at the time, seemed to be one that gave ataxians indirect benefits from weight loss, reduced fatigue that can be triggered by refined flour and sugar products, 
improved bowel movements and better mood. So even though there was not a lot of research at the time, and this diet did resemble a more traditional diabetic diet, there did seem to be indirect benefits for people who had movement disorders like ataxia. National Ataxia Foundation does have a fact sheet that addresses nutrition and ataxia, and it's in your handouts, as well as a PDF copy of this particular book. And I've put the links down there, and I hope the handouts will be available to people after the presentation. Next slide. So the first thing that I think we knew 25 years ago and is still true to today, there is no dietary cure for regular ataxia. Ataxia that is not related to a known metabolic problem, maybe a genetic ataxia or a non-genetic ataxia, but there is no dietary cure for these ataxias. Next slide. This is an article that was published uh, by our European group, um, Dr. Giunti's lab, and she's based in Great Britain, looking at guidelines for the diagnosis and management of progressive ataxias. And we have similar articles and guidelines that have been looked at here in North America as well. In this article, she points out, I think, two important areas that we can look at. The first one is table six, it's a little blurry, but I think you can see it, which talks about treatable causes of ataxia in children where there is a nutritional or dietary intervention. And these are very specific inborn errors of metabolism. The first one is a problem with getting glucose into the system, into the nerves, into the mitochondria. Clearly, if you can't get glucose in to make energy, you need to find a workaround pathway. And for this, the ketogenic diet allows ketones to be generated, and those can then be turned into energy. The second one, hypobeta-lipoproteinemia, is a deficiency of a protein that carries vitamin E around the body and to the places where it needs to go, and the nervous system is very dependent on vitamin E. So the treatment for this is to supplement vitamin E, which can help make up for the deficit in that decreased protein level. Hartnup's disease is a problem with absorption of the amino acids that are required for making vitamin B3, that's nicotinamide. So again, you can supplement the diet with tryptophan, which is one of the amino acids that is not being absorbed. By putting more in the system, more will hopefully be carried to where it needs to go. Or you can supplement with vitamin B3 directly. There is an additional very rare condition called biotinase deficiency, which is a deficiency of biotin. Um, and there you provide supplements of biotin as you would with any vitamin deficiency. And we all know about B12 deficiency, folic acid deficiency, which can affect the nervous system and the treatment is supplementing with those as well. The final one on this list is pyruvate deficiency which directly relates to the ability of our mitochondria, our little energy factories, to make energy. We need pyruvate to power up that little factory. And there are people who cannot make pyruvate or transport pyruvate. And again, ketogenic diet is a way to work around that pathway. And they also have used thiamine, carnitine, and lipoic acid. So over the years, certainly in children with these inborn errors, very specific diets or supplements have been found to be disease modifying. Next slide. Next slide. Table five in the same article shows other ataxias that can be treated by diet or vitamin modification that are more common in adults. Gluten ataxia is one that most of us know about. 
it has been found to be an immune inflammatory cause for non-genetic ataxia in a percentage of adults who develop ataxia. It is diagnosed by finding antibodies to gluten or gliadin. Those antibodies produced by our immune system in people that are sensitive to gluten and develop those antibodies, those antibodies cross-react with proteins in the cerebellum and damage the cerebellum in some people, leading to the development of ataxia. The diagnosis is made testing blood. You can also test you know, more specific markers for gluten ataxia. Ataxia patients with gluten sensitivity may also have GI tract symptoms. Um, they can have diarrhea, they can have irritable bowel, they can have other symptoms which reflect those antibodies attacking the gut itself. However, you can have ataxia on the basis of gluten antibodies and have no GI tract problems. Obviously, a gluten-free diet will help the GI tract symptoms in those who have it and is felt to be helpful in reducing the antibody stress on the brain as well. However, the gluten-free diet is very strict. Even a small deviation will cause you know, gluten antibodies to peak up again. And it's always good to work with a dietitian at designing a gluten-free diet that is manageable. Gluten, we know, occurs in wheat-based products, but it is present in other grains. It is present as an additive in many prepared products. So you have to read, a, be, read labels and, and be a very educated consumer. Retesting the blood for the anti-gliadin or anti-gluten antibodies, perhaps every six months, will let you track your progress in reducing those antibodies on the gluten-free diet. The next ataxia that is relatively common in some adults is associated with vitamin E deficiency. If not from the protein problem that we looked at on the last slide, the A-beta lipoproteinemia, it could be a dietary vitamin E deficiency. And again, is treated with vitamin E supplements, as is ataxia with vitamin B12 deficiency. It's important if you're diagnosed with B12 deficiency to also have your folic acid levels checked as those two vitamins work together and you want to be sure that both of them are at normal levels so that you're not treating one and overlooking the other. Ataxia with CoQ10 deficiency is relatively rare, but it has been documented as a secondary factor in some patients with Friedreich's ataxia, and it does occur in some patients, especially of Asian extraction with non-genetic ataxia. It can be tested in the blood and treated with high-dose CoQ10 supplements. Next slide. This is from an article that I cite at the top that talks about aging and age-related mechanisms that may be related to diet or may respond to dietary interventions. That's a summary of much research that's been done looking at micronutrients, you know, vitamins and minerals, um, flavonoids, polyphenols, you know, things that we see in brightly colored fruits and vegetables, um, omega fish oil, which is the um, omega-3 PUFAs at the bottom of the left side of the screen, as well as other lifestyle factors, restricting calories, ketogenic diet, Mediterranean diet, and exercise. So there have been some indications in animal studies that any of these interventions seems to slow up aging in the mouse, for instance, 
um, and may have interventions in improving circulation, um, blood factors like cholesterol or anemia, um, reducing inflammation, um, and having impact on other pathways that lead to brain aging. All of us have brains that are aging, but the fact that many ataxias, genetic and non-genetic, seem to occur or begin at about the same time that brain aging begins in the non-ataxic individual, and this is usually sometime after the age of 35 or 40, there's some thought that aging mechanisms cause the expression of ataxia in patients in those age groups, which then progress there are many unknown factors and certainly genetic factors that could trigger it, but the aging pathways may speed it up, may give it an open door or window to begin showing symptoms. So it's possible that lifestyle interventions, adding you know certain vitamins and supplements, you know enriching your diet in, in brightly colored fruits and vegetables, um, taking omega fish oil exercise, and then some of the um, popular diets that have been looked at as anti-aging diets, the intermittent fasting, the ketogenic diet, and the Mediterranean diet might slow up progression of a disorder like ataxia in the aging brain. Now, human studies looking to make links between these interventions and brain aging that occurs in the setting of dementia or Parkinson's disease or ataxia haven't been definitive, but there is enough basic science evidence to warrant further intervention um, in a research setting, for instance, or if an individual wants to try one of these interventions for three months or six months to see if it makes a difference in their ataxia, these are things that are not um, looked upon as, as fads necessarily. They're things that may certainly have a role in somebody's management of their ataxia. Next slide. If you look up anti-aging diets, um, you get 118 million, it's probably more now, Google hits. Things like, you know, Red Book, 30 Anti-Aging Foods for Women That Will Keep You Feeling Young, or Dr. Oz, Anti-Aging Foods, um, a, an interesting website called The Pickled Plum. Many of them focus on healthy skin, reducing aging of the skin, but at least the few that I looked at are fortunately not being touted as diets to prevent Alzheimer's or diets to cure Parkinson's disease. So I think, again, if we're looking at the internet or looking at Dr. WebMD, we have to be educated consumers about what they're promising. If what they're promising is too exciting, too many bright colors, too many exclamation points, unrealistic goals, I think you have to think twice before committing yourself to something that could be expensive or potentially harmful. Next slide. So the risks of trying out popular diets or frank fad diets, whether you're using it for weight loss or anti-aging or other aims, if they promise too much, set unrealistic goals, that's a red flag. Sometimes they cost, they cost a lot of money, and you know it may not be a good investment for you. They often cut out key foods. Popular diets may cause dehydration, weakness and fatigue, nausea and headaches, constipation, and micronutrient deficiencies, inadequate vitamin and mineral intake. And that was one thing that we found 25 years ago when we were doing dietary surveys of our ataxia patients, um, sometimes just because of difficulties with eating, or the need to have quick nutrition as opposed to you know, more solid nutrition, the incidence of vitamin and mineral deficiencies, inadequate micronutrients 
came up often. So I think we have to be alert to the fact that our regular nutrition may not have everything we need, and certainly a fad diet may, may restrict us in ways that can cause other symptoms. So again, it's always good to consult with a knowledgeable dietitian, and if you want to try something out, give it six to 12 weeks and see how you feel. Next slide. The gluten-free diet, which we've mentioned as an intervention for people with anti-gluten, anti-gliadin antibodies, requires you to avoid wheat, wheat germ, rye, barley, bulgur wheat, couscous, farina, gram flour, semolina, spelt, and triticale. It doesn't leave a lot of grains that you can use. I mean, corn is still there, rice is still there. You have to read labels because there are many food additives that contain gluten in processed foods. And if you go completely gluten-free, you might become deficient in B vitamins, calcium, and iron. And you should work with your dietitian to determine if you need to take a supplement of those vitamins or minerals. Next slide. The wall diet is an anti-inflammatory diet that was first proposed for multiple sclerosis where the primary mechanism is an immune system mediated inflammation. Now it is felt in other ataxic disorders, genetic and non-genetic, that when the nerve cells in the cerebellum are under stress and are becoming weak, and some of them are dying, that they may trigger local inflammation in the cerebellum that could cause more damage. So it's not unreasonable to think that an anti-inflammatory diet could be helpful. The wall diet is a version of the paleo diet based on the idea that people should eat more like our ancestors and avoid foods that we started eating more recently, like wheat and processed foods, which can trigger inflammation. So on the walls protocol, you eat lots of meat and fish, vegetables, especially green leafy ones, brightly colored fruits like berries, and fat from animal and plant sources, especially the omega-3 fatty acids. You avoid dairy products and eggs, grains like wheat, rice, oatmeal. So this is a little more restrictive of grains than the gluten-free diet is. You avoid beans and lentils and vegetables in the nightshade family, tomatoes, eggplant, potatoes, peppers, and you avoid sugar. So again, it's often a major change in someone's eating pattern that they may be used to. In talking with behavioral psychologists, they say that if we're in the habit of doing something, of eating a certain way or not exercising, and you wanna break that habit, break that behavior, it can usually take 30 to 40 days of being as careful as you can with the new diet or with the new exercise program until you break the old habits and the new diet or the new exercise pro program becomes more natural for you. So you don't wanna start something like the gluten-free diet or the wall diet, and then after a couple of weeks, say, you know, I'm not noticing anything, I feel the same, this is really bothersome, it's, I, there's nothing I can eat. You really need to give it those 30 to 40 days to make it become part of your day-to-day -day behavior, and then over the next few weeks, begin to look for benefits. Next slide. Intermittent fasting has also come up, um, and it is an umbrella term for various eating diet plans that cycle between a period of not eating, usually about 16 hours, and non-fasting for about eight hours. So there's an eight hour window that you eat, whatever you're gonna be eating, and then 16 hours where you don't eat. It produces ketosis, but it's intermittent ketosis because you're eating and you're not eating. When you're not eating, you begin to generate ketone bodies 
as you would with the ketogenic diet, the Atkins diet, and to some extent the paleo diet that we just discussed. And then during your window of eating, you're back to metabolizing other things besides ketones. Intermittent fasting is under preliminary research to see if it can produce weight loss. Ketosis from the ketogenic diet, potentially intermittent fasting, is also used in certain childhood epilepsies that don't respond to medication and in certain metabolic conditions as we just reviewed, um, the adrenoleukodystrophy and the pyruvate problems. So using the body's metabolic pathways to generate ketone bodies by several different techniques um, to improve metabolism, improve metabolic support for your brain, your nerves, has been appearing more and more in the literature and is under intense research. At the bottom, there are pictures of the distribution of carbohydrates in orange, protein in yellow, and fat in green for each of the diets that we've talked about already. So your typical diet on the right is over half carbohydrates. It has 15% protein and 30% fat. The classic ketogenic diet, however, is 2% carbohydrate, 8% protein, and 90% fat. The Atkins diet, which is you know similarly targeting generating ketones, is a, a little more relaxed with carbohydrates, 5%. Protein is more relaxed, 30%, but fat is still 65%. The particular diet used for ALDAMN, which we have referred to, is called the medium chain triglyceride diet. And again, it does have less carbohydrates than the normal diet. It has less fat than the Atkins diet and the ketogenic diet, but the fat that they give people are medium sized fats. We have fats that are very small in size. We have fat molecules that are very big in size, and then you have the ones that are medium-sized. People with ALD, AMN can't metabolize the very large fat molecules, so they replace those in the diet with these medium-sized molecules, which prevent the buildup of the abnormally large fats. So these are all diets that have been studied in the literature. Um, they have good science behind them. But as you can see, as you get more rigid with the Atkins diet and the classic ketogenic diet, um, it probably is going to take a good dietitian to help you plan what you're going to eat so that you're not, you know, getting hypoglycemic and passing out because your blood sugar is too low. Um, a number of years ago, we did try the ketogenic diet in a group of our patients with Friedreich's ataxia because we suspected that they had a problem generating energy, which when they finally discovered the gene 15, 20 years later proved to be correct, that they couldn't generate energy from sugar. So we decided to try the ketogenic diet. All of them, these were young adults, had low blood sugar, were passing out. It, it's hard, I think, for an adult to do a classic ketogenic diet. Children and infants are better able to tolerate it. Next slide. Mitochondria generate energy in our nerve cells, which demand a lot of energy. In the aging nervous system, which overlaps the onset of many of the genetic and non-genetic ataxias, mitochondria seem to be weakening, dropping out, becoming less functional. So as part of normal aging, there has been a focus on the role of mitochondria. They produce energy for nerve cells, they promote nerve cell connectivity, they protect against nerve cell death, and they're weakened in aging, they're weakened in genetic and non-genetic ataxia, either as a primary problem, as in Friedreich's ataxia, or a secondary problem in many of the other ataxias. Next slide. 
so that the mitochondrial diet, if we want to tackle the issues of aging and the role of the mitochondria, includes the ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, or increasing intake of cofactors and supplements that stimulate mitochondria, such as CoQ10. So when we think about all the things that the ketogenic diet is supposed to help with, intermittent fasting, um, you know, as it produces intermittent ketogenesis, um, it does come back to a known part of the cell, the mitochondrion, that if we could prop up the mitochondria, protect them and make them work better, it could alter the progression of an ataxia. So again, a lot of research is going on in this area. I cited those two articles on the slide previously, but there are many more looking at ways to protect nerves in aging and in the progressive ataxic disorders by focusing on the mitochondrion. Next slide. Who should take vitamins? If you look at general recommendations, People over the age of 50 might benefit from taking vitamin D, B12, and folic acid supplements. The frail elderly might benefit from a low-dose multivitamin. Women of childbearing age should be taking folic acid and vitamin D and maybe iron. All of these levels can be checked in a blood test. Children with a balanced diet may not need vitamins. Possibly calcium, maybe iron, but again, the pediatrician will guide you with that. Multivitamins don't reduce the risk for heart disease, cancer, or cognitive decline. There have been studies looking at multivitamin supplements, and if you have a risk for heart disease or cancer or memory loss, um, it's, they're, they're not going to slow those up. And vitamin E and beta carotene supplements, which have been used as anti-aging supplements at very high dose, appear to be harmful. Probiotics have been popular to regulate the gut microbiome, the, micro, the bacteria that we have in our gut that, that keep our, our gut function normal. Probiotics have been shown to be helpful with gastrointestinal problems irritable bowel, con you know, constipation, chronic diarrhea, um, bloating. Research, however, is also going on about the role of these healthy gut bacteria in brain health. There is nothing definitive yet, but we know that healthy gut, healthy gut bacteria do have a positive effect on inflammation. And we know that inflammation can accelerate aging-related problems. So I think we need to keep our eye on the healthy gut microbiome research. Next slide. Weight loss in chronic disease. It's not unusual for people with progressive ataxia to have unintentional weight loss. If it's more than 10 pounds or more than 5% of your normal body weight over six to 12 months, it's a concern. It could be due to changes in metabolism, decreased appetite, difficulty eating, which will be addressed in the next section of this talk, treatment to control unintentional weight loss, increasing caloric intake, using an appetite stimulant, or consulting with your speech and swallowing therapist about better ways to eat more easily and safely. Next slide. So I want to thank you, and I'm sure we'll come back to some of these thoughts um, in our question and answer period. Um, I'd like now to turn the program over to Amanda, who will talk to us about speech and swallowing issues as they relate to nutrition in the ataxic patient. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Lori, are you going to try to turn controls over to me? Or should yep. I just ask you for some speech? You should be able to try it now those arrows. Okay, great. Wonderful. So my name is Amanda Gallagher. What's that? I think there was just an internet delay earlier. Oh, gotcha. Uh, my name is Amanda Gallagher, and I am a speech language pathologist, which is synonymous with speech therapist. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about 
diet modifications that can come along with um, difficulty swallowing and some things to keep in mind related to diet modifications, how to maintain um, adequate intake and nutrition and some safety concerns to be mindful of. So uh, in speech pathology, speech therapy, uh, one of the realms that we work with people in is uh, in the area of dysphagia. And dysphagia is the medical term for any kind of difficulty with chewing and or swallowing. Um, and this is a concern for several reasons. Uh, dysphagia can lead to weight loss and malnutrition. It can lead to dehydration, um, choking, and it can lead to pneumonia as well due to aspiration, which aspiration is, um, is the medical term for anything go that goes down the wrong pipe. Anything that goes either food or liquid that goes into our airway, which is the trachea, and it goes far enough down that it gets below our vocal cords, which when we swallow, our vocal cords are the last line of defense to close up our airway and keep things from going down that wrong pipe. So if something gets beyond those, uh, it's considered to be aspiration. And the problem with aspiration is that nothing is supposed to go into our lungs except for air. So whether it be saliva or food or liquid, even water, uh, that gets down into our lungs that can sit in our lungs, breed bacteria, and can lead to a pneumonia. Um, and pneumonia can be very serious, even fatal, if not treated. Uh, so it is a big safety risk uh, along with choking on solid foods as well. Um, and choking is anytime there's a solid food that's large enough that it blocks the airway and we're unable to breathe, speak, cough. Um, so there are a few things that we do in order to help people who have difficulty with swallowing in order to try to maintain the best safety as possible when we're eating and drinking and to be able to get all of the calories and the nutrients that we need to get through our day. So how does dysphagia impact the ataxia community? Um, there is an, an article in 2015 um, that looked at a variety of studies um, and from this variety of studies, it was a review paper, uh, they found incidence rates of dysphagia in people with ataxia based on what type of ataxia that they had. Um, now, the, the ataxias that you see listed on the screen are the only ones that uh, research was found to be able to at least try to quantify the incidence of dysphagia. Uh, and unfortunately, frankly, we just need more research in this area. Um, there is not a lot to be had. There we go. Apologies, I think I just had an internet uh, break. Okay, so if somebody is having difficulty with chewing or swallowing, uh, first and foremost, if you feel like you're having any kind of difficulty, you should let your physician know, uh, and hopefully, they're going to refer you on to a speech therapist for an assessment. And an assessment is a, a list of uh, questions and asking for, you know, what kind of difficulty are you noticing? Any certain foods, any certain liquids, any certain time of day, any situations where it's harder to swallow, things like that. And then we take a look at how the muscles that you use for swallowing, how they're moving. We look at the range of motion of those muscles and the strength of those muscles to see if there are any impairments in the muscles themselves. Uh, and most of the time, as I'm sure that you would guess, uh, for people with ataxia, the difficulty in swallowing comes from coordinating the movements of the lips, the tongue, the jaw, and the throat muscles in order to move food or drink safely from our mouth down to our stomach. So when it comes to solid foods, if somebody is having difficulty with swallowing solid foods, we can recommend modifications as to what textures um, are the safest and the easiest for the person to swallow safely. And there are three general levels. Um, and we're gonna talk at the end of my portion of this talk about a new system that actually is coming along. But the information that I'm about to give you about modified diets and thickened liquids is uh, up until this point, our uh, you know, historical classifications of these diet levels. So when it comes to modified diets, there are generally speaking, three general areas that we classify foods into. One is pureed foods. So a pureed food is anything that's blended, it's a consistent texture, it doesn't require any chewing. So things like yogurt, pudding, 
oatmeal, cream of wheat, mashed potatoes, custard, things like that. The next uh, level of solid is a mechanical soft or a soft solid. So these are foods that you do need to chew, but they are soft cooked and ideally cut into small pieces to make it easier to chew. So think about things like very soft cheese, bread, uh, vegetables that have been steamed to be soft cooked, and fruits that are softer. Think about um, bananas, cantaloupe, things like that. And then finally, there are the regular texture foods. So these are any salads that are dry or crunchy or difficult to chew, require extensive chewing, things like that. So these are your raw vegetables, um, you know, your meats like a steak or some other kind of dry or tough meat that takes a lot of chewing, pretzels, crackers, chips, uh, things that are crunchy and crummy. Um, and something to keep in mind is that uh, when we make re recommendations for modified diets, uh, let's say that we do an assessment and the, um, and the person seems to have the most ease and the most safety with a mechanical soft diet. Um, that mechanical soft diet level would mean that the person should try to stick to uh, foods that are the same texture as some of the ones that I provided. And obviously that is not an extensive list. Um, it's just some of the ideas. But that person it would also be safe to consume any diet levels that are easier to swallow. So in this case, if you can tolerate a mechanical soft diet, that would also include puree foods because those are a little bit easier to swallow since they don't require the chewing and they're, they should be softer and slippery, slipperier, more slippery uh, and easy to swallow. So next we'll talk a little bit about thickened liquids. And Lori, may I ask you to advance the slide for me? Thank you. Uh, so just as somebody may have difficulty with swallowing solid foods, they may have difficulty with swallowing liquids. So um, some kind of classic um, Things that people notice or complaints that people have are I cough when I drink, it feels like water is going down the wrong pipe, or I choke on my water. Um, so when it comes to liquids, water is considered a thin liquid. So there's nothing in it to give it any kind of texture, which also means in the liquid world, it moves fast. So something that is a thin liquid like water takes the most coordination from the muscles in order to control that liquid to stay in the mouth as long as we would like it to, to not leak into our throat before we're ready to swallow, to not leak back out of our lips while we're getting ready to swallow. And then when we swallow, it moves the fastest. So this chain reaction that happens when we swallow that's so quick, but so precise and happens in one to two seconds, if there's any discoordination along the way, thin liquids move very quickly to the path of least resistance, which unfortunately is our airway. It's the kind of the first available opening that the liquid can head to. Um, so if somebody is having difficulty with swallowing liquids, the way to make them safer is to start to make them thicker. So what you see on the screen are the various levels of thickened liquids that can be recommended or prescribed. So the easiest to swallow are the thickest liquids, and that's what's on the top of the list. So putting thick liquid describes the level that um, you add thickener to the uh, to the drink so that it is thick enough that it actually is going to look like a solid. It's going to look like a pureed food that's on the spoon. And if you have a spoonful of it and you turn it over, it's either going to stay on the spoon or all fall off together in one cohesive um, lump. The next level of thickening is a little bit less thick, and those are the honey thick liquids. So these really do, you really do want to picture if you were pouring honey out of a container. And think about the fact that honey flows, it's a liquid, it moves, but it moves very slowly because of that thickness or viscosity. And it's gonna leave a coating on whatever you're pouring it from, or if you were pouring it from a spoon, it would, it would completely coat the spoon as well. The next uh, level of thickness that's a little bit, um, less thick and therefore a little bit harder to swallow are the nectar thick liquids. Um, this is something like uh, maple syrup, 
pouring out of a bottle or off of a spoon. And then the hardest to swallow, but the thinnest liquids are called thin liquids. And those are our, you know, generally our regular liquids that we are used to buying, water and coffee and soda, et cetera. Now you will notice on the list under thin liquids, Jello and ice cream are considered to be thin liquids by most speech therapists um, or many speech therapists because they are, um, they're in a solid state when you put them in your mouth, but they melt. So as soon as they hit that 98.6 degree uh, temperature in our mouth, they start to melt and then it's, it's like you're drinking a liquid off of a spoon. So just some quick tips to think about regarding thickened liquids. If somebody is on thickened liquids, all liquids must be thickened. There is no, uh, let's say um, the recommendation is for nectar liquid. That means that there is no thin liquid that's considered to be safe enough. So we're recommending this nectar thickness. So all liquids, and that includes things like, um, not only things you drink out of a cup, but things like a broth-based soup. However, the good news is that any liquid can be thickened if you use thickener. And so, you know, any of your regular drinks that you could think about, broths and soups, a glass of wine, a glass of whiskey, anything can be thickened if you add thickener to it. Uh, but then you want to keep in mind that if you are thickening something, you don't want to add ice cubes then to what you've thickened because that's as the ice cubes melt, it's going to water it back down again. Um, so you want to consider using some reusable ice cubes like you can get at a home goods store to keep in your freezer. That way they won't melt and change the texture. And also good to keep in mind that you do want to talk to your dietitian if you have diabetes or if you're following a specific diet, um, uh, such as some of the ones that Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Perlman outlined, uh, because they, the thickener and the pre-thickened liquids that you can purchase online may have a higher level of carbohydrates, so you wanna take that into account. And uh, you wanna take your supplies with you when you go out to eat. Um, you can do single serve packets for a lot of thickeners that makes traveling easy, um, or you can portion them out yourself, or you can, um, you know, these days it's nice with travel mugs, et cetera. You can make your own drinks and take them along to a restaurant as well if you don't wanna thicken at the table. So some recommended um, foods, liquids to avoid if you are using thickened liquids are anything that melts like we talked about, and then mixed consistency foods. So these are things like cereal and broth-based broth soups, which they are a liquid and a solid mixed together. So you just wanna be mindful that you still need to thicken that liquid. So you need to thicken your milk before you put that on your cereal. Um, and then also keep in mind that juicy fruits like oranges and grapes and watermelon, if you're on thickened liquids, um, those would pose a risk because the juice that's in the fruit that's going to come out while you're eating it is thin. Um, on the flip side, if you are trying to stay hydrated, those juicy fruits can be really nice wet snacks that are a really good way to get some extra hydration if um, thin liquids are safe for you to drink. Um, some resources for finding thickened liquids, I've included some websites. I do not work for any of these companies. I don't specifically endorse any of one of these companies, and this is certainly not an all-inclusive list. These are just some kind of starting places if you're looking for um, ways to find uh, thickeners online. There are many different types. There are gel-based and powder-based, and it's really just personal preference. Um, for what tastes the best and what's easiest with your lifestyle. You can also get thickeners at any um, drugstore or at Walmart or at Rite Aid. Um, and sometimes they do keep them behind the, behind the actual pharmacy counter. You do not need a prescription for these thickeners. So I think sometimes they keep them there just to be able to keep an eye on stock or something like that. So you may need to ask, um, but otherwise they're usually in the aisle, same place where you would find insure and things like that. And then, um, the website that's the swallowingdisorderfoundation.com has a nice video on thickened liquids and how to thicken. Um, it has some other information about swallowing difficulty, which is nice. And then ASHA.org. ASHA is the American Speech Language and Hearing Association. That's the governing body for speech pathologists and for audiologists. And if you go to their website, it's really nice. Uh, it's divided out for um, information that the public would be interested in, and then also information for specific professionals. So you can go on that website and search dysphagia diets and get a lot of information about uh, anything from research studies to recipes to um, 
uh, recipe books that are available out there. And this is also a good place if you're looking for a provider. If you think that you would benefit from seeing a speech pathologist, um, you don't maybe you don't know where to find one in your area, uh, you can go on that website, type in your area and what kind of therapy you're looking for, and it will give you a list of providers. So uh, getting back to talking about solid food, some quick tips if you're um, on any kind of soft or mechanical soft diet. This is, I, in my experience, the mechanical soft diet is the one that um, people find the trickiest to navigate to make sure that it's soft enough, um, that it's not going to be too challenging, but also solid enough um, that it's not airing on the side of puree all the time. So just things to keep in mind for soft diets. Food should still be cut into small pieces, ideally about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch, no bigger than a half an inch. And your food should be soft enough that you could mash it with a fork. It doesn't mean that you have to, but it's a good um, rule of thumb to know if it's soft enough. And there are many cookbooks available these days for different dysphagia diets. And Amazon search alone comes up with many, 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 um, which is good to keep in mind because uh, when you think about um, being able to maintain nutrition if you're on a modified diet, you want to take into account that you still want food to be desirable. You want it to taste good and look good. Um, and so being able to find those recipes and those resources uh, is very important to help keep intake where you want it to be. Um, you do need to get calories through a variety of foods uh, to make sure that you're maintaining your um, vitamin and mineral balances. So this is where it's really important to work with your dietitian to make sure that you have a good variety um, of foods in your diet to keep you healthy. And um, you know, if let's say somebody's on a pureed diet, it can be it can be tough. Uh, you can get into a situation where you identify a couple of foods that you really really like the most. So you want to eat those the most, which makes sense. Um, but then your diet may be lacking in vitamin any vitamins or minerals that aren't available in those specific foods. Um, and then overall, you want to um, think about risks of dehydration if you're on thickened liquids. The thickened liquids themselves will allow you the proper amount of hydration if you are drinking the, um, the proper amount of fluid as you're supposed to. However, sometimes they just don't taste as good to people or they're not as palatable and so people start drinking less fluids. Um, so in order to try to maintain intake of the thickened liquids um, to be adequate, you do want to make sure that um, the thickened liquids don't become too thick. They tend to thicken as they sit over time. Um, they, you don't want them to be any thicker than they need to be. So you wanna make sure that things don't get too thick. Think about using different types of thickeners, which we touched on a little bit there, gel-based and powder-based. Um, it's a little bit of trial and error for everybody. Whatever the temperature of the drink is supposed to be, try to serve it at that temperature. If it is a cup of hot coffee that's thickened, try to serve it when it's hot. Um, or if it's a very cold drink, please try to serve it when it's cold. The room temperature range just doesn't taste very good. Um, and then there are things called natural nectar. So if somebody is on a nectar thick liquid um, at the grocery store in the international section, the Goya line of products, for example, has things like um, peach nectar and uh, apricot nectar and they're in a can and those, um, you have to test them, um, but those can be thick enough that you don't have to add extra thickener to them. Also like a really true tomato juice that's nice and thick or things like cream-based soups. And like we talked about for hydration in general, let's say you don't have any difficulty with liquids, but um, maybe you're on a soft diet, think about using some of those um, kind of wet snacks, those juicy fruits to try to get some more hydration um, into your body. Um, and then also keep in mind that I am not a dietitian, so I am only going to touch on this briefly. I highly, highly, highly recommend that you talk with a dietitian to find ways to fortify foods if you're finding that your in intake is decreased just because of difficulty with swallowing. Um, sometimes it's just really tiring to eat. Um, so think about using juices and milks and creams if you're blending things down, adding sauces and gravies, and think about breaking your intake into multiple small meals and snacks throughout the day versus trying to force yourself to sit down and eat three large meals. Um, that may just be too tiring and too overwhelming for the muscles. 
And last but not least, I just wanted to mention the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. I'm only going to touch on it briefly because, honestly, I am not yet uh, an expert on this myself. But I think it's important to know that this is coming. And basically, it's a, if the goal is that this there will be this new global standardization so that internationally, um, we are all referring to these different levels of diet modifications and thickened liquids in the same way and using the same scale and measuring them in the same way to make it easier for carryover and education, et cetera. So I put this up here because in the next few years, if you're seeing some um, providers, you may find that some of these terms are popping up and this is why um, there's great uh, there's a great website for ITSE where you can get a lot more information about it. Um, but just wanted to throw it out there to be aware. And uh, so now we're gonna open it up for questions. Um, I think that I've tackled a couple of questions that I had in advance just about uh, thinking about proper bite size and chewing, uh, thinking about different foods and beverages to maybe avoid or adapt um, for making drinking easier. So I'm going to turn the floor back over to uh, Dr. Perlman to be able to answer some questions that may have come through while we were talking. Okay, thank, thank you, Amanda. Um, a question from a, a, a listener, um, I am following many of the WALS protocol principles, including intermittent fasting, no gluten, ketogenic focus, lots of veggies, and good fats. Is this a good diet for ataxia? In general, if you're embarking on a diet that is altered from you know, our normal Western diet you should consult with a nutritionist to make sure that you're not going to end up deficient in important vitamins, minerals, or other factors. And you need to give yourself at least a month to get used to it. And then another several weeks to see if you feel any better on it. If you don't feel better on it by let's say three months, you might want to reconsider um, you know, that diet and, and look for other, other interventions you could do. Two additional questions that address, you know, how to manage an intermittent fasting regimen. One individual is juicing celery first thing in the morning and drinking 16 ounces. And does this break the intermittent fast if she's going to be consuming that during the fasting period? And another individual said that they're drinking what's called bulletproof coffee, which has in it um, the addition of a tablespoon of grass-fed butter and a tablespoon of medium-chain triglyceride oil, those medium-sized fats that we talked about. Does this break the intermittent fast? During the hours of fasting, it is accepted, and you can see this on any of the websites that discuss this, that you know you can you know drink you can stay hydrated um anything that you're consuming you know the 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 juiced celery or the the bulletproof coffee if it doesn't have carbohydrates in it that will trigger insulin then you have not broken your fast so potentially this person it, during the 16 hours of fasting that that he or she may have taken on would be allowed to consume that that um, celery beverage or the bulletproof coffee as those ingredients will not break the fast. An additional question um, is asking about um, having been told to eliminate gluten or follow the keto diet, um, is there any benefit for doing either of these regimens or would a balanced diet like the Mediterranean diet, which isn't as extreme as the keto diet or the gluten-free diet, also be helpful? I think there is evidence of health benefits with the Mediterranean diet, certainly for weight loss, energy, even mood. Um, whether it will have an impact on metabolism that could influence ataxia, not clear, but certainly, you know, any dietary change, get used to it, monitor it for an appropriate amount of time, and then decide if you want to continue. 
Is the gluten-free diet required for people with ataxia or does it not matter? Only if you have evidence of gluten antibodies in your blood should you try the gluten-free diet. That is the only situation where it appears to have an explanation for how it might be helpful. Are there any results from consuming blueberries, mainly because they are rich in resveratrol? Uh, I'm asking as an antioxidant for Friedreich's ataxia. And as we said, many of the diets encourage brightly colored fruits and vegetables, berries, um, resveratrol, and other polyphenols are felt to be good antioxidants. Unfortunately, to boost your antioxidant resveratrol levels enough with blueberries, you'd probably have to eat a carload of them. So I think a balanced diet, rather than over-focusing on one particular component, is going to be safer. Which foods a nine-year-old boy diagnosed with Friedreich's ataxia should consume to improve B and E vitamins? Now, I don't have this at my fingertips, but you can Google foods high in vitamin B, foods high in vitamin E, then it will give you a list of foods, usually ranked by highest levels to medium levels to lower levels. And from that, you can design a diet that will hopefully not be too different for your nine-year-old, um, you know, who may be used to certain foods. Um, but I think, you know, you should certainly explore um, any, you know, options that will improve nutrition for any person, young or old. I had two complete micronutrient evaluations done through an outside lab. Do I recommend another service to get this done? I mean, the lab that you cite, SpectraCell, you know, has the same technology that any of the other services do. Um, so I think if you've had those micronutrients assessed and have gotten useful information from them, then, you know, it they, they should be okay to continue them. Supplements are appropriate only if you've been demonstrated to be low in any of those important micronutrients. And then I think a final question that hasn't already been addressed. And if there's any questions that we haven't touched on, you know, obviously I'd be willing to respond via email or through the NAF. Which sweeteners can be used to replace sugar? That is a problem because artificial sweeteners stimulate the same brain receptors that sugar does. So you won't get rid of your sugar craving and it may have an influence on metabolism. You know, you think you're avoiding sugar and you're doing a good thing for your body, but artificial sweeteners may undermine that. So, you know, I think naturally occurring, you know, fruit sugars, um, you know, there's sugar in fruit, there's certain, you know, there, there are sugars that occur in vegetables. Um, are probably safer for your brain and your body than, um, you know, uh, artificial sweeteners, saccharin, and some of the others. So I think I'm going to stop here as we've, we've used up our time, but I look forward to answering any further questions um, that we can send through NAF or you can contact me directly. And if I may, I have um, two questions that would be um, fairly quick to answer, and I think they're important. I didn't touch on them. Uh, one is, what's the best position for eating and swallowing dysphagia? with dysphagia? That's a great question. The best position for all of us, swallowing difficulty or not, is to make sure that we're upright when we're eating or drinking, even just a little sip, even just a little snack. As soon as we start to recline just a little bit, gravity starts to work against us and can easily pull things down uh, the wrong way into our airway. Um, so think about that even if you just want to get a quick sip of a drink off of your bedside stand in the middle of the night, you do want to sit up to do that. And then um, does the does thickener change the taste of foods? Um, so, and are they high in sugar? So some are higher in carbohydrate count than others, yes, um, but not all are. And they don't change the flavor of the liquid, but um, because it changes the texture of the liquid, some things 
that um, people are accustomed to drinking one way. So for example, water. Water's not supposed to taste or feel like anything. So as soon as you put anything in there, it starts to taste not like water, for example. Um, and people who are coffee drinkers, um, I notice that that's the biggest feedback that I get other than water is people who are coffee drinkers don't love it in their coffee. Um, but for the same reason, it doesn't change the taste, but the texture is different. So it just doesn't feel right. Um, and then finally, the temp does the temperature of foods or liquids impact dysphagia um, and they can yeah there's research to show that different temperatures um, can help us to swallow better or can be more challenging but the real answer is that it's different from person to person so unfortunately that is one of those things where having an evaluation to find out that for you yourself um, does it have an impact what the temperature is you, you want that evaluation with a um, speech therapist to find the answer to that thank you Thank you uh, to our presenters. That's all we have time for today. Thank you again, Dr. Perlman and Amanda Gallagher, and to all of you for joining today's webinar. And we will uh, be in touch with answering any unanswered questions in the days uh, following this webinar. And thanks again for joining us.